Hi, Kristen from the USA. It must be pretty early for you. Thank you for joining. Jeremy in Kenya, welcome. I'm Suleiman Diallo from Mali. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet you and welcome. Hi, Benio, all the way from Korea. Thank you for joining. Right, I think we've got enough people to get us going. Once again, a very warm welcome. Um, my name is Rufaro Mandebebe. You can call me Faro. I'm based here in Harare, Zimbabwe, my country of birth and home. And very excited to welcome you to the last of the series, but certainly the last of the many conversations that will be held. Uh, hosted by a wonderful REN21 around Rendezvous Africa. I'm pleased to introduce Rana Adib, the Executive Director for, um, for REN21. She will introduce our panel and speak to today's exciting topic around just dimension of energy transition processes across Africa. Welcome Rana, great for you to, for you to join us again and over to you. Thank you so much, Rufaro. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome from my side also to another rendezvous. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion we're going to, to address today, to the topic we're going to address today, because uh, it's a topic that is very, very important, um, but has probably been less in the focus uh, during the last uh, rendezvous, which we're focusing very much on economic opportunities, markets, um, the transition from fossil fuel to, uh, to renewable energy, et cetera. And um, so maybe just to, to set the tone again for the ones who participate today, maybe for the first time. So Rent in One is a community of uh, players from government, NGOs, industry, research academia. And uh, this community really working together to make the shift and the transition to renewable energy happen. And um, part of this is really bringing uh, those players together as we're doing here around the Rent in Africa to um, also speak about the topics that might not always be in the focus of the attention, have the opportunity to basically confront and uh, exchange very much uh, the different perspectives and have a discussion that also goes beyond uh, the institutional positioning, I guess. So um, from my side, just to, before moving to Simona, who's going to uh, start with a lightning talk on this topic, I would just like to um, share two short slides. Um, why? Because I, I felt that uh, during the last uh, Renting on Academy, we had actually come up with uh, something quite interesting or um, very quickly. You're all aware of this. You have already seen the slide, I would imagine, for the ones who participated. This is basically the energy picture globally. And uh, it shows the importance of fossil fuel. It shows that we are, con we are basically consuming more fossil fuel than ever. And that even though renewable energy has grown, um, we're far away from moving to um, an energy system, an economy, a society that is renewable energy based. So we're speaking about very profound structural transformations. And I think what is important in the discussion we're having here, but also we already had throughout the rendezvous, is that we see that energy is an enabler for many things. And as a result, uh, there is also a diversity of drivers. Um, we obviously hear about uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, uh, clean air, economic opportunities in Africa, very much the energy access discussion. So the interface or the nexus between um, energy and development, um, cost discussions, opportunities for industrial development innovation. And then there is this topic of energy um, democracy and sovereignty. And I think this really leads us to, uh, it leads into the discussion we're having. And here, and this is where I'm going to end, this is basically what uh, we have come up uh, with at the last uh, Rent One Academy, which took place in 2020. 
Um, the Jedi approach, Jedi for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And for the Star Wars fan, um, the um, the illustrator who worked with us through uh, this conference uh, came up with it. So renewable energy can be a vehicle of transformation of society, for, tra for the transformation of society. And I think this is exactly what we are going to discuss and explore how things what needs to happen to make this happen? And uh, I'm very much looking forward to, um, sorry, I'm trying to stop ending, sharing my slides. And uh, to the lightning talk of Simona Kla, um, who is going to, um, so Simona is uh, working um, at the University of Kassel in Germany and uh, is uh, overseeing the research group uh, Global Power, which is specifically looking into the global transformations of energy systems. And um, yeah, Simona, I think uh, we've read a couple of your papers and felt that this is really highly relevant uh, to frame the discussion. So very much looking forward to learning more about what you're doing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the introduction and also for the invite to share some of our research we have done over the last couple of years um, in our research project that's called Global Power Funds, Tools and Networks for an African Energy Transition. Uh, we are now in the fifth year of our research, so um, it's always getting kind of to an end. But what we learned in the last couple of years is that we also have to ask the question, how can a just energy transition be achieved and what's actually being needed? And um, Rana just mentioned some of our papers. Um, I will draw on some of them uh, during the talk. And as I'm not really aware um, how familiar everyone is with the concept of energy justice, I will draw a little bit, a little bit on that um, doing doing uh, my uh, doing the talk. Um, I will just like tackle some issues, but um, and we can go deeper into it and also. Um, talk about a little bit about more about concrete examples uh, in the debate afterwards, because I think it's, uh, I can also learn a lot about the people where people who are in the room today, um, who are actually also practitioners um, on uh, that scene. So um, you probably all be aware, I think uh, Rana was just saying, you talked about how, how much you know, possibility is there on the African continent for renewable energy and, um, investments, and also to, to address the SDG 7 um, for access to energy. And um, there is already a big trend globally to invest a lot in renewable energy and also on the African market. Due to the corona pandemic, there has been like some drop down, but still it's like a prospect, prospect market uh, when you would say uh, and looking at, uh, at that. And what we learned um, in our research was that uh, we found out that everyone, like the most driving uh, part was a market-oriented transition pathway that um, involved um, feed and chairs to tender programs and that you in particular find in those countries who already have a kind of strong, like in comparison, like for the African market, a strong market and a strong state, what can, like managing that and um, navigate to that. We can also see, um, we also learned when we're doing this research that there are also some um, uh, African state would also have not the same opportunities, in particular because they're also struggling with other issues much more uh, regarding poverty, for instance, and that they are highly donor dependent. Uh, for instance, what we learned was Togo or Mali, um, as like to, to naming some, uh, some examples. Um, so taking that, we will also question ourselves, okay, what actually has to be done um, because renewable energy and access to energy has to be a little bit more than just like be there. Uh, it has to be also how um, the people can participate, how is it equally distributed, um, and how actually everything fits really well together so that it will really benefit for uh, the ordinary people um, uh, in the, the several countries. And um, what we um, what we draw on is a kind of dimension of uh, different dimension of energy justice. Um, there is a big debate um, what um, Kerstin Jenkins and others were, were pushing on 
different kind of um, energy justice criteria, uh, but they were also mainly focusing on the global north and not looking uh, how that actually what that actually means for uh, um, global south countries and in particular when we're looking at uh, African countries. So there is like on the one hand like this kind of um, three kind of different energy justice types like the procedural, distributive and recognition energy justice and just to highlight like one or two things in that is when we are looking at the procedural energy justice is how kind of what kind of potential those kind of energy justice has for democracy for um, public consultation and how um, the um, population can be um, part of this kind of whole um, energy transition and then the question the second part is about the distributive energy justice is about is it like how can rural electrification can take place does it have to be a grid integration or is it off grid probably much easier in particular in the rural areas and what actually means when we're looking at pricing renewable energy uh, for tackling energy poverty and poverty itself because not everyone has the capacity also to pay um, for um, uh, the energy consumption and then also what kind of possibilities renewable energy has for creating new jobs and also job market participation for um, the local communities. And the third part is the recognition energy justice, uh, um, where we also were looking, looking about, okay, how we can actually specific target specific groups, like in particular, very often when we're talking about women, but rural, but also poor and what's actually with refugees. So that's um, the broad frame where we are trying to put into our like then direct research on um, the African um, the African states. So and questioning you know, how can justice be achieved by political means and how can energy policy be in kind of reformulated according to justice theory. And I think that's a part I think you probably might be also interested in uh, what we would say as researchers. Um, and what we found out during uh, the last couple of years, what we think could be um, criteria for a just uh, energy transition. So when we did this research, we used, um, on the one hand, um, this broad energy justice criteria um, and also looked how, what kind of energy policy were used. So we used the ARENA, uh, categories of um, direct, in the, um, uh, integrative and enabling um, policy for renewable energy. And we try to map then around um, the 35 countries, we, we looked more into detail, uh, how are they actually meeting the energy justice criteria and how not and why so. So you can see that there is um, a lot of um, like um, what we see a kind of really a good broad purpose renewable energy policy framework and also some justice criteria and justice criteria is Mauritius, Rwanda and South Africa. Um, for instance, South Africa, I know that it's my, the South African colleagues would like disagree in this regard, but one important part was that they put into the renewable energy independent power produ producer program, uh, the socioeconomic criteria, because that is not the case in other countries. Um, and also trying to um, ensure participation and consultation, not in all infrastructure projects, but also in some. And then when we're looking like in the middle, you see like this kind of like some are doing something and nothing, um, a little bit like the party met. So what I found very striking was looking at uh, Capo Verde, for instance, um, that um, has a really ambitious renewable energy plan um, and trying to, to be um, independent from energy, from, um, uh, from the land and just only um, generating energy uh, they, uh, on the island, but they were also still missing some consultation and also participation of the local community because they were using a consulting firm uh, for providing this kind of broad energy policy and then the state was just implementing it. So this is just, um, and then we st still have this, uh, the, uh, those countries where we don't really see a renewable energy transition policy framework and energy policy and also uh, only not really met justice criteria and that you can actually see on the one hand in the very poor countries like Burkina Faso or Cote d'Ivoire, but also in those countries where like very strong based on uh, and focused on oil like Angola or um, 
uh, Angola or when we're looking at Democratic Republic of Congo on other um, energy sources. So this is um, like how we actually tried to, to map around different kinds of renewable energy transition scenarios in our research. And um, we, we learned uh, um, that we ought to find some different kind of ways they're actually dealing with it. And um, in Zambia, for instance, um, they are highly donor dependent, um, but there's not really happening any kind of like really limited consultation process in the, in the population. So when we're looking at the market driven solutions, so we have this kind of international investments coming into renewable energy sectors, um, but then only in specific, specific markets. And then we also see that there's not really good job creation in manufacturing within the countries, what you could observe in Zambia, for instance. And um, on the other um, hand, you could also observe that there's a sometimes domestic resistance to this kind of private actor driven renewable energy transition. And, and one example, um, there's also rather, several other reasons could be were also be the South African trade unions who actually were trying also to push back renewable energy transitions um, also because of the fear of job losses uh, in the mining sector. So this is um, like one um, of those um, uh, like really sneak, like just like some headlines regarding that. So what um, we actually also find out that there's enormous lack of case study groups, but actually looking at justice factors in the global south. And we have seen that a lot of have distributive justice, but the only focus is to electrification and access rather than also integrating other SDGs like decent work and job creation and industrialization, also renewable energy um, um, uh, sector. And um, the procedural justice also is only not really taking place because there's a lot of money and also investments and structures are coming from international private actors and donors who have not really the big interest, have a big long consulting process and, and have a participation of the, um, um, of the population because um, they also have the interest in profit. What's next? No, also, when we're going back to the mountain driven solutions in renewable energy um, transition. And what we think, what it's needed, and um, I am um, you know, the more uh, deeper incorporation of local stakeholders from industry and politics in the implementation transition, but also um, considering more also domestic firms to be part in the infrastructure building um, and that they also get the opportunity to. to to build up uh, also components for the uh, renewable energy um, infrastructure. And I think fostering a ju just transition also has to be um, depending on what kind of role everyone has like uh, in this kind of process. So government policymakers can assure with a good set of policies that um, uh, and mainstreaming energy justice within renewable uh, energy policies so that there is a framework for that where investors has to also be taken part um, and has to be re um, reliant on that. And um, also to the government can ensure and policymakers to ensure the participation of civil society. Uh, and we can also learn from other processes what happened in civil society. And I'm still very impressed and um, about the whole process about the climate justice culture um, the South African uh, civil society have built in the last couple of years and, that, and, and trying to push the theme um, that we have to think about justice much more broader than only on renewable energy, but also on climate and then on this whole societal justice as well. And the third point, when, we, um, uh, when we're looking at development partners and regional organization, it's also important that they have a kind of transition scenarios so that states who have not, not their own capacity to have a vision how they can actually implement it, that they have some guiding uh, tools in doing so. And um, on the other hand, we also have to think about creating jobs and decent jobs within, for instance, in the a, in a SADAC energy agenda or um, um, support um, policy learning and also have a kind of African peer review mechanism for renewable energy policies. And you could also see when we're looking at the different kind of energy policies, 
that there are some energy policy, renewable energy policies who are very similar in tone and focus and others are very different. And you could see um, how that actually um, um, took place. And I think um, we also have to think about what actually also need um, to secure and make it attractive for investment for the international donors um, so that there's a win-win situation and that there's more domestic participation in the whole process. But because in the moment, what we are observing, it's a mainly international driven process and not a process driven within this, from within the society. And um, I keep it with that. We have made a lot of like written contribution to that. And I can go into detail a little bit more here and there. Um, I also have like brought some case studies if you're interested in a little more uh, in depth, but I'm also very interested in your ideas about how just energy transition could look like uh, because you have more, that's just my ob our observation from our research we did. So we are not involved in like the whole practices uh, on the ground. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simona. This was uh, really insightful. And I, I think it's extremely interesting actually to go back to like a theoretical framework of defining the different types of uh, justice, I guess. And then probably also thinking about what are indicators that can really be strategically built in, I guess, like a, uh, maybe a, a question because you mentioned uh, case studies. I would be really interested to, if you could just uh, before moving to a panel discussion, uh, share like uh, some of the success criteria you see where from the good case studies that can inspire. What are the two or three main actions taken to um, to make a just transition happen and integrate them into energy policies? I think you're muted, Simona. Yeah, um, sorry. I was looking for uh, where I can unmute myself. Mm. Um, I hope that works because it's uh, is that working. Yes. So I was talking about like South Africa, and that's also the the country I'm I have the best knowledge because I did all a lot of research studying there. Um, so we, we we looked there, for instance, at the um, uh, independent power producers program over the last couple of like from 2011 to 2018 and we're looking really in detail on every project um, and we're looking on transnational investment how that is actually covered in those projects and how um, we, um, much local ownership is in there for instance so we'll see in the South African case there's like 30 percent of all those projects um, are um, auto localized ownership and when we put that all this kind of information into like the energy justice performance um, and in those three criteria, we were looking at the recognition one so there was a local content requirement for local industry um, there is a huge social economic development contribution um, from over 380 million south african rand and um, there's also um, Lead is still like, like a push for job security and energy access, but uh, also the procedural criteria were met when we're looking at the social program development participation for local communities who were partly involved in the process, but not, not everywhere. But, um, um, and South Africa also implemented an integrated resource plan, what they have done a huge public consultation in parliament and also before. Um, where um, and did a huge call uh, for that as well, and the distributive part in the uh, performance have been um, their energy companies have to share revenues and ownership with local communities mm -hmm. after a certain time, but still there has to be something to um, to go back. Um, there is a little bit of job creation in this area, but it's also kind of different, like it's a, uh, you need more semi-skilled and high-skilled workers uh, this, uh, when you want to running like solar and, and wind energy and um, um, and, the, and it has direct um, effects on the electricity tariffs. And 
one part where we haven't looked at that, uh, that but without the whole program, renewable energy, the, uh, the whole program, um, South Africa would have much more load shedding in the moment that, that it would have, because it's like still buffering a little bit. And it's, uh, that's like one, um, uh, one example. And the other um, example, it's a kind of different, different layer, but the, um, in, the South, uh, in the Zambian case, um, uh, what we put in the middle, uh, like some carriers met and others not, it's um, uh, more donor funded um, a fund, uh, beyond the grid fund for Zambia. Um, and the idea is um, to put like rural Zambians to provide them access to clean uh, energy. And they had a tender for that. And um, uh, very important was what actually would be the price uh, in the end. And, um, oh, sorry, that was too, well, too quick. Um, and the rural communities um, were actually targeted, they were involved in that process, and they should be have basic electricity access um, and also some knowledge transfer, because when you're working off grid, you also have to be able to repair them and also able to know how to, how to manage um, uh, to manage it. However, there was little involvement of domestic um, industries because all this kind of technique came somewhere else. Uh, one of the, the winners was um, um, Mobitel, what actually has been the first time, I think in Uganda or in Tanzania, I don't know uh, actually now, but and there has been no really engagement with the civil society or state representatives because they actually had to plan to involve the rural electrification agency, but they haven't really. So the mm -hmm. state haven't really been part of it. And that would be, I think, maybe two examples um, mm -hmm. we could look at. I would have a short one, but okay. I think that's then. Yes, so I, I think, no, thank you so much. That's perfect. And I'm pretty sure you'll have the opportunity to bring third example and even more into the discussion. Mm -hmm.